Welcome everyone to this evening's event. I am Scott Edgar. I'm the Assistant Arts and Cultural Programmer at Belfast Linen Hall Library. And uh, this is our final event of 2021. Um, so you are all very welcome. And after this, we will, uh, I, I will be having a well-earned rest and uh, you will have a lot of stuff to keep up with on the Linen Hall Library uh, website and YouTube channels until the new year. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Linen Hall Library, we're the oldest such institution in Belfast and we're the only library in Ireland that still generates a proportion of our income from membership. Uh, if you enjoy this evening's event, please visit our website and there you can find out more about how to become a member. Uh, for now, I will keep everyone placed on mute. If you've got questions or comments for our guests this evening, please just type them into the chat box and we will get back to them at the end of time permits. Uh, this evening, we are joined by Angela Graham. Angela is an award-winning filmmaker and journalist, having produced work for BBC, ITV, S4C and Channel 4. She then turned full-time to writing in 2017. Her poetry has appeared in The North, The Honest Ulsterman, Poetry Wales, The Ogham Stone, The Open Ear, The Interpreter's House and other publications. She's currently working on a novel and engaged in a prose and poetry project on place and displacement in the context of urban violence. Her debut collection of short stories, A City Burning, is out now. And we will hear more about that this evening. Uh, Angela was nominated for the Pushcart Prize in 2019 and long listed for the Edge Hill Short Story Award this year. Uh, she also recently won the inaugural Ulster Scots Writing Competition at the Linen Hall Library. Uh, we'll hear much more about her work and her connections to the library now in this engaging chat with the director of the Centre for Irish and Scottish Studies at Ulster University, Dr. Frank Ferguson, and I will hand you over to Frank. Um, a very good evening and, and thank you, Scott, for the, for the introduction. I'm delighted to um, really be asking, uh, you know, uh, what I hope are a lot of um, pertinent questions. To, to Angela, um, you, you've been given a, a, a really good introduction to, to her and her work. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight, though, is the idea of short story as witness. And to, to draw upon, I think, what Edgar Allan Poe said about a short story, it should be something that you should engage in in one sitting and then be able to move on from it. So we're hoping that this will be a sort of short sitting where we'll deal with a lot of questions about the um, the short story and what is actually meant by witness. Uh, good, good evening, Angela. Um, I, it's I, I, I kind of think I've I've known you for a while, but maybe you'd like to say how how we first met uh, and you know and and what you were looking um, for um, in asking about Ulster Scott's work at that point. Yeah. Well, in um, 2016, 2017, I spent as much time as I could in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, looking for what I should write a novel about. Obviously, I'm from Belfast, but I've lived in Wales for 40 years. I speak Welsh and I've maintained a lot of contacts in Northern Ireland. And now I spend most of the year in Northern Ireland and just a few months in the winter in Wales. But when I went over in uh, 2017, I just went over trying to put aside my preconceptions of Northern Ireland. And I went around the whole six counties and I kept my ears open. And the thing that really struck me was the sort of contention around the issues of language, particularly Irish and Ulster Scots. So I went to meet Frank at Coleraine University um, because he has edited the kind of ultimate collection of historical Ulster Scots right up to the 20th century. And, um, and that's how we met talking about language and um, I, I wrote a novel then about <laughs> Irish and Ulster Scots in, in Northern Ireland. And um, I re my background is my father's father and mother were what we would now call Ulster Scots. And the more I heard Ulster Scots spoken and read it, I thought, well, that's like what my grandparents and my father spoke. And I realized I had a residue of Ulster Scots in my inner ear. And so it was a great pleasure to, to allow that to come up to the surface again. And I was enormously pleased, therefore, to win the prize for poetry a couple of weeks ago at the Lennon Hall Ulster Scots Writing Competition. Now, one thing that's always struck me about you is that you're, you're a great traveller and there's always a sense of movement. Oh. And th does, is this something that you wanted to channel 
into a, into a city burning because you, you're one of the most busy writers, I think, at, at the minute. Who you, There seems to be lots of things happening. Did a city burning come before the idea for the novel or was it something that was has run for a number of years, perhaps? Um, and Christmas is coming and, and stockings need to be filled with good writing. Uh, yeah. Perhaps you'd like to give us a little bit of uh, an overview of, of off a city burning and, and what's in it? Well, there are 26 stories in a city burning and they're set in Wales, in Northern Ireland and in Italy. And those are the three countries that have, I suppose, meant most to me during my life. I went to Italy for the first time when I was 16. And because I'd studied Latin in school, I picked up Italian by ear pretty quickly and always maintained connections with Italy. So we have the Irish in Italy and the Italians in Wales and the Welsh in Northern Ireland in the stories in A City Burning. And because I was a busy television producer and I had a lot of family responsibilities, I could only write short stories. I couldn't um, 10 years ago, six years ago, have written a novel because I didn't have time. So the, the short stories sort of built up over a few years and in 2017, I decided to put broadcasting to one side and concentrate on writing. And um, I sent more than, I think maybe about 36 stories to a very good editor in Wales, Gwen Davis. And that was a wonderful experience because she was objective. And she wrote back to me and told me that I was an expert in some very dark things. I was shocked. She said, I knew a lot about suffering as an act of war. And I thought, I don't know what, and you know, and, and that I had most of the stories, well, many of the stories were about witness, about characters who witness something and then have to decide what to do. And I, I, I pushed back against that for a while. And then I, I thought, actually, she's right. You know, when one of the stories is actually called Witness and I didn't see that. So that's how the book grew with these. Um, she took all the funny ones out, by the way. I can actually write comic terms, but she said, no, no, we've got to keep them all serious. So watch out for the next book. It'll be a laugh. Um, where do you think this, this, this concept of witness comes from? Because it, there are lots and lots of um, how to guides out there to, you know, in order to understand the short story and what you should say and what you shouldn't say. Um, where do you think for you the, the kernel of, of a short story grows from? Well, there's several strands to answer that. Uh, I had a wonderful English teacher at school for the first five years at grammar school, and she gave us lots of poetry, plays and short stories to read. And we always had to write a version of the short story, for instance. So there's a very famous short story by Ambrose Bierce called An Occurrence at Isle Creek bridge I think it was written in 1890 you can find it on um, online and she told us to write it from the point of view of one of the minor characters and um, I have never forgotten the experience of writing that story because it was a wit and I realize now it was a witness story with somebody witnessing a, a tragedy and to answer your question about where does all this witness stuff come from I think it, a lot of it comes from the fact that that um, my puberty, adolescence and young adulthood exactly coincide with the beginning and development of the Troubles. So I can remember before the Troubles and I can remember that point of change. And um, I, I used to come home on the way home from school. I always felt I had to have an alibi, you know, like somebody was going to stop me and say, where have you been? And a very acute sense of there was stuff going on that I could see and I, I, can, I can tell in the stories that, well, I'll say this, just yesterday I looked up the etymology of the word witness, which I had never thought of doing before. And it comes from Old English and from Scandinavian roots, you know, wit, which means knowledge, and ness, which means a condition or state. So witness is a state of knowledge. If you're a witness, you haven't simply seen something, you have acquired some knowledge. And that, to me, is a crucial difference. The short story is sometimes called a glimpse, the art of the glimpse, or it's a slice of life. But for some internal reason, to me, this seems to be more an act of witness. So the protagonists in the stories see something and that puts a responsibility on them. 
They are in a state of knowing. So what must they do? And Frank has referred to the prize winning poem, the Ulster Scots poem. And actually that line is in that poem. What then should we do? And um, I think there's something quite Ulster about that. You know, there's something in the character which is not content to see. You actually have to take responsibility and give your word of witness about a thing. There's there's a real sense actually I find in, in the stories of it it's it's not even a case that the reader uh you know has to work things out. You're you're very forthright, you know, that 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 almost northern um um virtue of being forthright and and letting us know exactly what what there is did did you have a great compulsion when you were reading that that you wanted that that there maybe are a number of things that you wanted to say and that that you were going to say them yes <laughs> that's the answer to that um because um i i just feel that you you that your characters are often left in very shocking places and, and one of the things i think that is very brave is particularly the, when it deals with the troubles that that you're not that you're not frightened of going back and and bearing witness um either when it's looking at particular um groups or or individuals who may have been forgotten or or issues that we find very difficult to deal with today did did you did you feel spurred to do that or did you have any misgivings maybe about writing about the troubles no i had no misgivings about writing about the troubles don't see why i should um that's my life that that was my life so i have every right to write about the troubles or not write about them if i don't want to and in the book um you know later in the book uh, well there are stories that are nothing to do with the troubles and then the last few stories are um about uh, the pandemic you know so um i think generally what spurs me is i uh, um if witnessing injustice you know we see something we know it's not right. What are we going to do about it? And I think um, in, in modern days, we are constantly being, being offered the chance to be witnesses through the media. We see stuff going on all over the world and we feel implicated in that. In fact, we see so much, we witness so much that we can feel exhausted and we can feel, um, as the Ulster Scots poem says, for fauchen, faithless exhausted and not knowing where to go and I think many of us it's particularly in the pandemic have have lived that experience of sort of one weight after another so uh, a, a, me as a writer it's just natural to to write about that because that is what I feel we are living okay some of the stories are about things that happened 40 years ago 30 years ago 20 years ago but why does anything from the past have a value in the present? It has a value if there's something human in it, something that everybody can recognize the pain or the struggle or the hope or the funny bits. So. Yeah, I, no, I, 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 I agree. And it wasn't it, it's this is not an interrogation. No, sorry. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm also wondering, though, in what ways maybe does the concept of witnessing come in because i get sometimes there's, there's there's this almost sense in the legal sense of of being a witness and bearing witness but also shot through the book are stories that deal with with matters of faith or people who represent faith perhaps more so is is there a theological dimension do you think to what you're you're writing about um yes i think so because um witness has a legal sense it also you know when you to give witness is um very i i married into a family of evangelical protestants and they have a very strong sense of everything you do every day every breath you take should be witnessing to the lord and um i i just well, i suppose in the end this is how it, it was natural to me to write a short story I felt there was a lot of things to be said that um, didn't get said often enough and people who weren't often enough represented like children in the troubles, for instance, you know, so in the first story, it's a child's point of view. 
And maybe this uh, would be a good point to read that story. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. No, I think that's a perfect point. Yeah. Um, this, um, some of you will have heard me read this before, and um, some of you may be interested in the writerly side of this. So if, if, if it's not new to you, um, I would suggest uh, asking, listening out as we go through, and it's very short, it's only less than three pages. Um, where is the witness placed during the story? And also look out for the word imagine, because I have something to say about that in, um, afterwards. And I think witnessing is a kind of seeing, and there are many kinds of seeing, even in this short, short story. So this is the first one in the book, The Road. I made a film about it. Much later, I recreated it. Look, here, see? A static shot, a frame empty of people. We are at the dark end of a narrow, short hallway. The sun hits our two up, two down at the front most of the day, and in it reaches. But it can't quite stretch to this passage end and stairs foot. So it's from darkness that the camera looks out into the bright day. Summer outside, summer 1969, Belfast, East Belfast, where 96% of the inhabitants are Protestant and my family are not among that number. Ahead there is a tiny vestibule and the heavy front door is opened back against the wall. You can see the straight path outside, a checkerwork of black and oxblood tiles, three strides long. A hip high wall of smooth faced red brick is tight against its left side. It ends at a mustard yellow wooden gate. The matching terrace of houses opposite stands very close and towers in shadow. Imagine in that doorway, the back of a tall woman. She's on the threshold, arrested in the act of sweeping the first yard of path outside the door. Her right hand is at the top of the long brush handle. Another woman beyond the gate has stopped and is speaking to her, to my mother. It's a woman who lives in our street, but someone we barely know. She has never stopped before. She's on her way somewhere as she has a coat on and a hat. I see my mother straighten up and the brush head rise to a standstill, her right hand perched at shoulder level. The beveled head of the brush shaft nestles into the socket of her palm. What does this neighbor stranger want? My mother stalwart at the door waits. The woman looks anxious. I move forward just a little so I can hear. I am 12. All the children are being kept indoors for fear. The woman glances back up the street the way she's come and then ahead. She'll have seen the main road from where she stands and how empty it is. No passing cars, though it's only early on an August midweek afternoon, sorry, evening. She'll have known her voice would carry and be heard. I know something's going on. The woman is weak, hovering nervously like that outside our gate. She says she whines. Oh, this is awful, terrible. Things were all right before, weren't they? Before all this began. My mother would have assured her in some facile way, brushing again, moving the dust towards the gate. But I knew the truth, my mother too. Have you ever heard thrones fall? When the mighty are cast down, the thrones topple in their wake. They tumble from an infinite height, colliding and hitting off each other in an ugly way. It should be thrilling, and yet there is no sound, like a sound, like a silent film. For how could there be sound? It is a soundless fall or sounds like awe, oh, and awe oh, is a soundless thing. I feel as though I am deep inside a passage tomb, in a chamber that waits and waits while somewhere that fall on spools. For the moment when the times come right and the sun steps to its vantage point and shafts the hall, striking the core with light, then, then, 
there's a bark of laughter in the dark, a whoop that echoes off the walls. The words leapt inside me, licking the walls like flames. Things were not all right. What did she want us to say, that woman? Did she want us to tell her, you have no guilt. We'll be more than kind now that our day has come. We'll see, you right? She moved on. I went into the street. The sky where the sunset should have been was a weird orange rose colour and a tree of smoke had risen, was rising, crawling upward against it. Something huge was burning. The city west of us. Sirens trailed their tails across the evening air. Hurry, help me, save me, stop me. Each July the 12th, I'd be kept indoors as the bonfires at every junction blazed to keep us Catholics down. What's a fire now? Let them, let them taste fear for a change. There's another angle I never captured. A first and then a second soldier was shot when I was 14. When I heard that three had been killed together, I felt a spurt of reasonable delight. Their loss, not ours. I was again in the house when I heard. I was standing in the living room. The door to the hallway was open. Its wall that I could see ahead of me was papered in white embossed stripes and the masterful sun thrusting in and along made the contours bold in profile. By hedges then, I heard on the radio news, sparse march hedges and roadside winds, I imagined, on a cold bray and spiteful sleet on their gullible teenage skin, a pint glass glinting in the ditch, their trousers down. If I'd touched it, the wallpaper would have been warm, warm to the touch. It couldn't be right to be glad. I stepped into a humble road of cheap black tar hedged either side. A child can choose. So, thank you, Angela. That's it, it. One of the things I find about your prose is its ability to shock and yet its leanness of, of, of word. Um, and the, the, there's a really strong sense of poetic um, that, that's going on there. When you imagined the, you know, the, this short story, what did you see first, in a sense? Um, you know, where did, where did, you know, where did this go? Because this, this is a very short piece of writing, but it takes us to a number of places. Mm. Uh, well, it was the, I'm very careful in the story to position the witness with, with great precision. You know, trying to give a very precise sense of being at the foot of a stair in a narrow hall and it's all described and there you know what's ahead of you. And then in my the mother figure, my mother in the frame and um, the neighbour coming in and the child is carefully moved up the hallway so that I could hear. And uh, I can see that it is a very careful witness statement. Mm. And then the child goes out into the street and witnesses this extraordinary thing, the city burning. Mm. And, and then there's a big shift in the story. Have you ever heard thrones fall? What? <laughs> it's a totally different register. Yeah. And in the back of my mind there was the Magnificat. Um, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has sent the... Uh, the rich away in the imagination of their hearts or something like mm. that. And it's, it's a story about a shift in power and the terrible pit that, 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 that a person might fall into. You know, when the wheel turns and the person is on the up, our day has come. Mm. Is, that person going, is that person going to be generous and magnanimous? No, initially this protagonist is not. It's a vicious reaction to those, and I'm sure we all remember, it's a real incident, the three Scottish soldiers that were murdered. And 
the point of the story is uh, that the hallway is used twice. Mm. First, like a kind of ancient Neolithic passage tomb image. It's about to be the solstice on the 21st of the sun shafts inwards and whatever you know the dead come to life mm -hmm. and then the, the son does it a second time but what the child notices is the the you know warmth and life mm -hmm. and it cannot be right to be glad that three young men have been killed a child knows that a child yeah. can choose it's and what i've noticed when i when i've read this to live audiences it, somebody always says is that autobiographical it's fiction, <laughs> but I think it has a, a certain power to it that makes people think, you know, I hope it, me it means that they feel they've been there, you know, so and the, imagine that word is used twice, you know, imagine you see a woman standing in that doorway and then uh, it's used later, um, what the power of the imagination and the child hears on the radio and sees the roadside winds, the sleet. It doesn't have to be there. We don't have to be where tragedy happens to feel able to respond to it in some way. Yeah, it's and you know it's literally a threshold moment, and you know very much from this, this you know as you say this concept of imagine. I think it, it's it's also empathize that there's you know that that really powerful shift practically in in the last couple of of lines um that it takes it you know you need quite an agile reader sometimes <laughs> to to see exactly where they're going because there's that powerful sense of revisiting the uh, you know the beginnings of the troubles yet yet also sometimes it's it's that sort of shocking kind of story that we need to to remember um events uh, we're, you know we're, we're often good at misremembering things and and it's a story like this that um shows you know the potential culpability that that we might have as individuals and, and also the understanding of a child's point of view um it, it, it you know it's it's a perfect opening um story because i think we're taken on number of of journeys because it at, at times I was wondering, you're, this is a very northern kind of writing, but but as you say, there, there's a Welsh element, there's an Italian element. Um, one of the things that struck me actually about the Welsh element is that music seems to to figure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there's a lot of music within the, the Welsh thing, uh, you know, within the Welsh spaces and landscapes. Is, is that just coincidental or... I'm not asking you to choose a nation from the three uh, the three nations as a favourite, but is there something about Wales that lends itself to to a kind of musicality? Um, I honestly don't know, Frank. You know, I think there's as much Irish music in the book, and there's actually Italian music too. You know, yeah. there's this whole story about somebody not wanting to play the accordion and then realizing that he actually does like the Italian songs. So I think the answer is probably there's music in this book. Hmm. Um, okay. That's a very, it's a very diplomatic answer. Oh no. uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe we could hear um, the Welsh extract. I think that that's, that's a, that's a good space because it, as you say, there's this wonderful interplay of languages and, and accents and it, it makes a really good um, point now to, to hear the Welsh side. Um, perhaps Scott would play that for us. This is um, uh, an edited reading of the story All Through the Night by the Welsh actor and writer Geraint Lewis. He's very well known in Wales and he kindly um, did, a, did this recording. It's slightly time lapsed, so forgive us for that, but it's lovely to hear the Welsh, I think. I look back now with a kind of dread, yet dread is about, about the future, about what's going to happen, not what has already happened. So I dread the memory of pain. At Clogwynichel on the very edge of Wales, the roads are dark, 
some of them are tracks really and the stars sort of spread themselves out overhead display themselves with a careless glamour or like something much more homely like sugar spilt across a slate but up there up above the stars some flung themselves down the sky mad bastards most looked on in a dignified way blinking mildly at this recklessness and I thought of the song its beautiful tune Ho sham ran tire ser the way dant arhidenos arhidenos all through the night nothing like the crappy english version sickly sweet that and boring soft the drowsy hours are creeping visions of delight revealing hill and vale in slumber steeping and the stars don't get a look in not a mention you pointed that out to me when you were learning welsh how come you asked you were always asking that why is the verb here why do i have to say it? whatever and i'd say it just is mary i don't know why ask your teacher kariad gwin knows all that stuff yes he did didn't he holl am rantair sir am rantai such a great sounding word for such a work a day bit of us our eyelids all the eyelids of the stars are saying eyelids speak oh yes they shield or conceal they widen to reveal demar forth i fro gogoniant this is the way to the land of glory all through the night go on stars i remember thinking that night as i stood with them all above me show us the way oh i closed my eyes then i did because i was lost that stuff from the bible swam into my head pan edrych oi var nevod gwaith the said when i consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers the stars which thou hast ordained what is man that thou art mindful of him a little lower than the angels crowned with glory and honor shit nothing like a chapel up bringing for loading you with your stuff that makes you feel like shit in comparison sunday school set pieces so beautiful the pictures in your head the stars being set in place one by one like diamonds but me i was desperate and i suppose it was so i wouldn't cry that i did it i started to sing was i showing you i didn't care big man mad man to sing at a time like that Kol ay arashiut a wasuch, i ar ddangos gwir brad verthwch. Darkness is another type of light to show us true beauty. The beauty of the family of the heavens, the stars, in silence all through the night. And I went on, louder, that tune rising like a wave rolling up to its crest. Nor see you here, night pan thou casti. Night is old age. That's when trouble hits us, gets us in an arm lock and grinds us down. And the tune sinks gradually, gradually into calm and quiet, like a wave relaxing. Dark night is coming. It tells us our youth is dead. I, I couldn't roll with the blow so well. A man in my middle years, nothing special. On the harvi, din I hoir thee. But to make ourselves and our days end beautiful, to have something, at least something, to hold on to. 
Croning or like one in Gilead. Let's put our fragile lights together all through the night. I couldn't help it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't help it, I just cried. I thought you'd always be there, see? Archidonos. I stood out there and I cried and I knew you were watching me. I couldn't stop. The next morning, the stars had gone. We were still there. Our fragile lights together. Our lives are brief and here or no. Night is long. Again, another um, opportunity to, to witness um, someone um, opening up on something. Did, did you ever sort of feel a little sorry for, for your, your characters because you love taking them to this moment of revelation, whether a, a very positive or, 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 or a not so positive revelation, do you think, right, I'm going to make sure um, that you say something important is—is is that something that you see as, as as almost your role as as the the writer here? Well, I think a lot of this is instinctive, and uh, who wants to read a story where nothing much happens? You know, you want your characters to, uh, and, and, if I, and a good way to answer this is, you know, I spent thirty five years being a film producer and director, and um, uh, and mostly as documentary, but some drama. And uh, you get into the habit of starting the film close up to the, you know, you, you don't waste a long time with a long preamble. You get in when something is happening. So there's a kind of status quo, which you establish quickly. Then something happens to disturb the status quo. The character has to react. He, the character makes a choice. Things go well or they go badly. And another crisis develops. And then the character has to deal with that. So probably unconsciously, I was very influenced by that mm. and I know that some writers uh, write a lot of stories with open ends now that the last one in the book you could say has an open end on an, a, on a huge question perhaps perhaps the biggest question of existence you know but generally I don't like to leave um, readers wondering what was going to happen next and I of course I feel sorry for my characters um, yeah so and not that you know the, and, and in case you know people haven't read the book not, not every you know not every character will be in a dreadful predicament and there are some there are some wonderful things and and there are some very nice comic twists so not oh, not good. all of I'm glad to hear that. not all of the you know it's it's not all bad and indeed uh, there's some and, and and you know as soon as you as and I'm not going to explain the comic twists because as soon as you explain comedy it it fizzles out so I'm just going to say there there are really nicely paced um funny stories that, that go on so it, it it isn't all gloom but it is it, it has the you know just thinking of, of that story you have the real sense of how a song or a hymn works and you you thread the characters' lives around that, and it's it's really really satisfying. And I suppose the other question is, do you listen to music when you write, or do you find that you have to block everything out? No, no, no. Um, you know, block everything, pull the blind down, shut the door. Uh, however, I've got very used to writing with many interruptions, so nothing stops me. You know, I just do whatever opportunities I have. I write, and then I stop, and I start again. Um, and I think that's that's just it's just that's just how I am. Um, I think Frank is going to uh, to do a bit of reading. Yes. Yeah. They, just when you say comedy, this this story that, that Frank is going to read from isn't comic, but there is a light. The, the character that you're going to read is a bit of a lightness there. I I I re I, I really like this, and and you know, and I admire anybody who does wild swimming. And you know, I will cheer you on from the shore, you know, quite heartily. Um, but but there's a there's a character 
uh, in this. And I, and I, I just find it extremely natural way of using language. And it, and it's a, um, you know, if, if I say the words, it's, you know, it's a male swimming instructor, the audience are probably going to have an image of a certain type of swimming instructor, which this person isn't at all. Uh, and and, and I, I think well done for standing up for middle-aged men who have perhaps not um, held on to the physique that they started out with. But it's not so much his physique, it's what he says and how he says it, because it's a story based at the North Coast. And we have um, we, ha we have a woman sort of trying to work her way in the world, work out who she is, where she should go. And uh, she meets this person who speaks in the way that you would if you lived up there. So there, there, there are wonderful, powerful, I think, Ulster Scots and really unselfconscious Ulster Scots words, which have a real sense of the natural about them but a really powerful symbolic sense as well so there, he, he says things like dinny or think it um go on you he said uh to the next wee bay let yourself in and i'll be with you for long and and credit the water to hile you up and mind your breath i turned surprised if you wouldn't he turn to draw breath what hope would there be and credit the water and you'll or, or you'll wear yourself out thresh, thrashing and thrashing. And, and I just thought that was within those. Um, th there's a time I, I think, and now is probably one of the really exciting times of writing in Ulster Scots. And I got really excited to see this story um, because, um, you, you know, you're a writer who writes in, a, in an, an Irish sense and a Welsh sense and an Italian sense but also in an Ulster Scottish sense. And, and maybe you'd, you'd like to sort of comment on why you felt you wanted to put the Ulster Scots in at that particular point. Well, because, I, my, you know, my, my father's side of the family are from um, County Antrim and um, I live there now. And um, I suppose I've grown up with hearing people speak that way. And I just thought, I thought well, that's, you know that in the the woman in that story is quite intellectual and very well able to um articulate quite complicated inner states and there she is with this rather lumpen co-steering person who's a local and you, you, the story is structured so that you assume that he is not going to say very much or have anything much to contribute apart from helping her swim and in fact, it, he displays a sensitivity in a very understated way. And he just speaks the way he is himself. And he speaks the way he always speaks, which is in contrast to the rather hyped up, um, struggling woman, you know? So it was just a natural thing to do. And he has the last words in the story. Oh, well, surely, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, and, and because he he tells her that he's been out there in, at night to see the northern lakes, uh, like big green curtains over my head, and she hasn't got him down as somebody who would do something mad like that, and he does turn out to be calmly wise. <laughs> so yeah, the, and 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 I and, and I and, and I I kind of feel like there's there's a lot of potential that that you can read in there. W one of the things looking at. A word that occurs quite a lot in in your writing because i was able to do a kindle search is okay. road and roads and but sea also appears at times and, and i'll not give away to i'll not give away any other spoilers but different things happen at sea and on the water that then happen on land and, and the roads and there's a real sense of possibility in in this um and you know you can you know whether whether this might develop into a relationship or there's something more fundamentally. Yeah, you're an old romantic. In, I am an old romantic. I never you know, saw that. <laughs> who would have, who would who would have thought it? But the, I think the beauty is that the, the writing is sort of is kind of left hanging for us to to see that there are possibilities, but we're just not quite sure of, of what those possibilities, you know, really are. Um, I, I suppose to to maybe um, to begin to wrap up a bit to then offer um, the floor open to questions. Um, what do you think ultimately the short story is witness? 
gives the you know potentially gives readers but but gives you as as a sort of a, a way of doing things as a writer well that's not an easy question but i think um the short story as as an active witness or as we heard in that welsh based story somebody is witnessed the man's wife witnesses him and she makes a decision whether to stay with him or not you know i think the the, the witness approach um, puts the stakes high. You know, we don't think of witness unless there's something really important at stake. And I think it's a lot to do with truth. Um, you don't witness, to, you know, you, to, to witness is different to just telling somebody something. You know, you're bearing responsibility. And a lot of people have commented that the writing in the book is very spare. There's nothing superfluous there. And I suppose I've always been trying to, to drive, to, to get the thing said as clearly as possible, but at several different levels at once. And I think the short story at Witness offers, as Witness offers depth and commitment and potentially brings the reader into the position where they, they, that they, the reader is also thinking, well, what would I do? You know, so it's a shared human dilemma of, once we have seen the thing and known it, we now know about it, what then must we do about it? And that has always interested me. I, I think, and it's it's that old image of what does a witness do in court? They, they tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, and, and I think that that's what you really do and you, you really accomplish it so powerfully. And, you know, I think it's not just about the the spareness of language it's about the honesty of, of language that, that there's no kind of you know dare i say it wishy-washy postmodernism about the stories that fr fritters away i wouldn't recognize that if it hit me in the face frank uh, you know it's it's you know really powerful honest and authentic and 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 uh, you know it's just a, it's a wonderful collection and, and congratulations on, on on bringing this together um, I'm, I'm aware that there there are some questions and perhaps we can either take, um, I might go through some of the, um, there, there's one question at least I can see on chat um, from, from Adeline Henry, um, suggesting that the, you know, the first story that you read was, uh, was very powerful and the visual quality. Um, have you thought about developing uh, some of the stories, you know, sort of t turning, you know, uh, you know, 180 back degrees the, yeah. and, um, and back to filming? No, 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 I haven't. Um, I think that that's simply because I've been busy writing. Uh, and actually, I didn't realise that 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 so many people have said to me, there's a filmic feel to the style that I write in that I, I suppose I have to accept that's true. I didn't see that. But you know, apparently I have a telescoping technique where I often start with great detail and then pull back to the big shot or do the opposite, you know. And um, so I think this will content me for the time being. Uh, well, are there any other questions or, or comments or thoughts that anybody might have? Uh, well, I'll... I'll that there's a, there's a great um, question. Just let me. Um, uh, Lucy Cullen uh, says, many thanks for this evening. It's been so interesting to hear you speak about your collection and the short story form uh, more generally. I'm just starting a PhD at Queen's in Belfast and looking at contemporary short stories as a form that attempts to tackle taboos and destigmatize, particularly in relation to women's issues such as abortion, homosexuality, etc. As such, your ideas of witness and responsibility were fascinating to me. Therefore, to what extent do you think that the short story form is a call to action and could even be used as a form of activism? Br yeah. Brilliant question. Thank you. Well, I, I don't know the exact answer that, you know, to what extent can the short story be used as a, as a form of activism? But I suppose I would have to say that, yeah, I, you know, if you particularly if you look at the, the stories towards the end of the book, that there's a there are two stories about the pandemic and um, boy, they are a call to action. <laughs> you know, I think um, if I don't know if you've read the book, but uh, 
I think those story, one is called the, the Scale and the other one is called Sugared Almonds. Um, and um, particularly the scale is about um, political stasis and, and the, the cost we put on the shoulders of those who can least bear it. So it's about a domiciliary care worker expected to go into people's homes early in the pandemic without any PPE. And if that doesn't make the reader think, well, that, that's not good, you know, I have failed. So I'm, I'm going to confess something now, right? Uh, and um, I, th I think always if, um, if I see a barrier, my tendency is to want to get over it, you know, grab a flag and get over it. And um, I, of course, the short story can be called, used as a form of, of activism. What would you be writing them for if you didn't want them to make people change inside and do something? So there we are. I've outed myself as an activist of some kind. You know, what then must we do? We've read the story. If we feel it has any relevance to us, what then must we do? I think that's a that's a that's a great um, way for us to begin winding things up. I, I suppose um, the the question is, what are you doing next as as a writer? Um, oh. What's what's the next thing uh, that the, that you're hoping to do? Well, I've just finished a book which is um, uh, it's got um, two dozen poems at the front of the book, and then quite a long prose. Um, it's a, very long prose section, which is about my own family. Um, and um, so that's that's a non-fiction book. And I've just finished that and I'm editing that. And I hope that, um, and I've also done this year, a book on the theme of sanctuary uh, poetry. And I designed this book to, to model one of the meanings of sanctuary as a, a, a hosting or welcoming space. So I looked for two poets in Northern Ireland and two poets in Wales um, with particular experience of aspects of sanctuary. And as we know, uh, and particularly at the moment, sanctuary makes us think of migrants, of safety from disease, of climate crisis. So there are now three poets from Northern Ireland and myself, so that's four, and two from Wales, and there's a gender balance ish. And um, I hope that that will be out in March. I can't confirm that tonight, but I might know by tomorrow. So I'm very excited about that because that I I I this is um I haven't had a collection of poetry published before, and I'm really pleased that if in a way like my first collection is a joint thing, there are five other poets in it, and to me it's been a great experience. It's a rather unusual thing to do, uh, so I've been doing that. That has kept me busy. Um, uh, I'll have a novel to, uh, to finish editing the novel. So, Well, 2022 seems to be um, going to be another bumper year uh, for, for, for Angela Graham writing. So uh, watch this space. Um, uh, oh, and I have the Ulster Scots as well. I have to get on with writing that poetry, Frank. So there is a great deal of really good stuff in the pipeline. Um, uh, Nula has, has um, put in the chat many thanks for this evening Angela you paint very real and thought provoking situations real food for thought and I, and I think we really can agree with that uh, and I think not just agree but I think we're probably now being called to action and to reflect on on those those issues uh, both in creative writing and um, in what we should be doing as, as human beings and at, at this point in where we are in the world and uh, Adeline um, thanks to you all for this evening very stimulating such a great challenge to finish with Angela what must we do um, really powerful words I think to end on uh, I'd just like to say thank you for sharing um, thank you for uh, just a, a wonderful evening of helping us understand a, a good bit better about your you know your aims as a writer but also how important the, the whole idea of, of witness um, with, within writing is. Uh, thanks again to the Linen Hall for hosting it. It is really um, an important sanctuary, uh, I think we can say, uh, for, for like-minded people and a you know, real uh, beacon in, in dark times. So thank you for the Linen Hall for, for doing these, 
these events and, and long may they continue. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a very good evening from me. I'd like to thank Frank for emceeing so well and thank you all for coming. Um, I'd be very happy to hear from any of you anytime. Uh, and I hope you have enjoy the book if you haven't read it. And so thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to uh, echo everyone there and thank both uh, Angela and Frank for joining us this evening. Um, fantastically interesting evening and um, I remind everyone as well that as, as well as uh, Angela's other upcoming work, you will also be able to read that um, award winning uh, uh, poem uh, from the Ulster Scots writing competition uh, will be published in uh, towards the end of January around Burns Night in a, in a special Linen Hall Library publication. Um, thank you to everyone who came along tonight and who's joined us for events throughout this uh, quite challenging year. Um, I have had a, a great time doing these online with you and I hope to see you all again back in the library and online in uh, 2022. Um, so have a great evening this evening, and um, I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Good night. You. Good night.